All right, everybody, so this is the Unit 8 lecture on endangered species and what type of species that we find that commonly get endangered. Now, uh, for the discussion for this unit, I asked you all to name an endangered species and post a picture of it. And um, obviously I'm recording this beforehand, but probably most of you all, when you think about endangered species, think about, you know, the tigers and red pandas and maybe the, the giant panda here. But we oftentimes think of these really big animals, really charismatic animals, oftentimes really cute and fluffy things that everybody likes to see and play with. Now, uh, the reality, though, is slightly different. When we see uh, what species are actually endangered in the world, um, you know, this is a, a graph showing all of the endangered species in the U.S., broken up by different groups. And what we see is freshwater mussels, so like little clams that are living in our streams and rivers, uh, crayfish, stoneflies, these are insects, so other fish, amphibians, frogs, and um, salamanders. And we don't get anything fuzzy and furry until we get to the mammals here. So really, um, what we see of most of the things, at least in the United States, but really across the world, is that most things that are going um, extinct or endangered or close to being, um, basically, you know, the blue here is extinct. These are like really endangered, endangered, and these what we, in, the, in the U.S. we might call like threatened species. But, um, and this 69% then is referring to of the species of freshwater mussels in the United States, 69% of them are um, in trouble, at least endangered or threatened or already extinct. And, you know, it's not the super cute animals that, that most of us normally think of. And if we look at um, a picture of what's going on in Wisconsin, what we can see here is there actually aren't that many mammals. There's um, basically all the bat species that we have here in Wisconsin. Um, an American martin, it, that's kind of like a weasel looking, kind of like a real long predator thing, lives up north in uh, northern Wisconsin. But then we've got a decent number of birds, um, some amphibians, and this is probably just a function of that we don't have that many amphibians in Wisconsin, but you know, there's, look at all these mussels that we have, all these fishes here. Um, and then look at all the endangered insects and plants, a lot of actual plants that we have here going on that are um, endangered. So the picture of what we think of as endangered and what we um, <coughs> Excuse me. What we are actually endangered is is a very different thing. So let's now look into four reasons why certain um, organisms become extinct, or you know what what makes an organism have a higher probability of going extinct, and that is low population density, small area, specialization, and low production. So let's explore those four areas. So low population density. What we see is organisms that you know are out in nature, and we just don't find that many of them in one spot. Um, they kind of have the deck stacked against them. Okay, so let's. I've got grizzly bears here. Um, you know, you don't find in someone's back property. 40 grizzly bears all in one spot, right? There, it's uh, very rare to find grizzly bears all congregated in one spot. Really, it only happens when they're fishing for salmon, but normally they're, you know, miles and miles apart. So, that's because grizzly bears, you know, they are very protective of their food, very protective of their territory. They can't have other grizzly bears around them, um, otherwise they're not going to do well. So, Think about if you then cut the population in half or a quarter or, you know, frankly, what we've seen for grizzly bear populations, we cut the population down to a tenth. Well, one grizzly bear might have a really, really hard time actually finding a mate when it comes to mating time. 
you know, they could be 20, 30, 40 miles away from the nearest grizzly bear, and then they're never going to be able to mate, and that'll just be really difficult for them. So, and what we see is this is pretty common, kind of thinking about any, um, any species that has a low population density. Next thing is if uh, species are found within a really small area, um, that you know, again they have the de deck stacked against them. So really, what happens is a small development can have really. So so if an organism is only found in one small area, anything that you do to that one small area, and humans, as we know, are extremely good at changing habitat characteristics, are. Um, it's going to have a big impact on potentially the worldwide distribution of this species. So an example is the vermilion darter. It's this really cool, cute looking fish, right? Uh, really brightly colored. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of people actually like to keep darters in, um, in fish tanks. Um, and the thing is, they're extremely um, hard to keep keep in fish tanks the these these little darters really need to live in the flowing water and they live in these nice like crystal clear streams in the southeastern part of the US the vermilion darter is actually found in i believe the Tennessee uh river valley but it actually owned the only place it's ever been found is in 400 meters of one small stream okay and right when that species was found it was just kind of like by default endangered okay because um 400 meters you know it's, it's 1200 feet that's not very far it's not a big area and they're found absolutely nowhere else we don't really know why they're not really found anywhere else they need these really specific characteristics of the stream and they just haven't they're, they're found nowhere else so Imagine if a developer were to come in and say, hey, we want to put houses here along the riverbank or, uh, you know, it wouldn't take that many houses to completely make this um, change the stream and potentially make that uh, that species go extinct just because that's the only place it's ever been found. Uh, another example is the Komodo dragon. Uh, Komodo dragons are the largest lizard we have on the planet, uh, apart from being just super cool animals. Um, they have this, it's not really venom, but in their teeth they have these weird grooves and they eat a lot of carrion and dead stuff, so they have a lot of really nasty bacteria in their um, in their saliva, in their in their mouths. So what they'll just kind of do, they'll you know find a deer and just kind of like nip it give it a bite on the back of the um, back of the leg or something and then they'll just follow it around because that bite will fester and decay um, and eventually kill kill the animal uh, but they'll just follow around that deer for days until it dies and then once it does die they'll go up and you'll find a bunch of these Komodo dragons eating the carcass and ripping it apart and um, really cool animals right uh, but where they're found is in Indonesia. Indonesia is uh, actually a relatively highly populous country. There's about 200 million people that live there. It's in these islands here in the South Pacific. So Australia is down here. Thailand's kind of right up in here. Um, and what we see is it's only ever found been found on these four five islands here. Flores, um, uh, I don't know how to pronounce these islands, but... Um, what we see <coughs> is um, their largest population was in the island of Flores, okay? Uh, there's a lot of people that live on Flores, and agriculture has kind of forced these. As you can imagine, it's not very nice to live next to a Komodo dragon. Um, and so they're, they've been extirpated. Extirpated means no longer present, right? It's not extinct, but it just means no longer present in a certain area. Uh, from most of the island of Flores and the entire island of Pedar. So we only find these in these just couple little islands and couple spots in Flores and protected areas. So, you know, it wouldn't take much for potentially a hurricane to come through or, you know, maybe a tsunami or something that could happen or just, you know, human development on these islands to completely kill off this entire species. And it would be really sad because that species is such a cool species. Now another thing that we see is a specialization makes it really hard for um, for for some organisms to um, 
increase in number or bounce back from you know getting their populations cut down for, for a variety of reasons just because um, well some organisms have really specific habitats or you know food maybe let's say food so um, this is a cassowary bird okay it's found in northeastern Australia uh, might be found in Papua New Guinea I'm not really sure uh, but there's a tree that produces this kind of this fruit called that we call a cassowary nut now the bird itself um, it's a huge bird it's like well, not like an ostrich size but it's still um, I think around a hundred pounds and it's 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 you know the, the, the back here is about chest to shoulder high so it, it's a big bird um, and they're actually really mean. Um, they have a really big claw on their um, on their feet that can really hurt people if they um, come across. So people don't really like living next to these things. They're also prone to getting hit by cars. So they've been extirpated from a large area and um, a lot of them killed by cars. So their numbers are kind of going down in northeastern Australia. Now they can eat a lot of different fruits, insects, lots of different things. But the cassowary nut is this, nothing else can actually eat this nut. So the only thing that can eat this nut is actually the cassowary bird. So, um, and the seeds will only germinate when it gets eaten by this bird and pooped out somewhere and then, you know, the that seed is in this nice little pile of fertilizer that can then grow and germinate and turn into the tree. Um, but since we're seeing that these birds are going away from northeastern Australia, all of a sudden we're seeing there's really of uh, this tree with these cassowary nuts. There's no um, there's there's no baby trees. There's no seedlings that are being able to grow from from that. So what we can see is uh, this is a pretty complicated system for um, for this this tree, right? The cassowary nut without the cassowary, it's going to go it, it'll go away. So when um, when we see is organisms that have like a really specific relationship with another species, um, they're prone to going extinct because it's easy to, for basically, it's easier for humans or potentially nature to, to screw up that system uh, just because, you know, they're so tightly linked. Whereas, say, look at rats, right? Um, rats can eat pretty much anything, right? They can eat plants, they can eat meat, they can eat garbage, they can eat just about anything, right? So if one food source goes away from the rats, it doesn't matter. They have everything else in the world that they can eat. Um, so in, they're not specialized at all. So they're not in danger really of, um, of going extinct. Now the, the fourth characteristic of species that we see is uh, that makes them susceptible for extinction is low reproduction. Maybe this could be slow reproduction or number of babies at a time. It doesn't there's different ways you can think about this, but a uh, great example of this is a Madagascar palm, okay? Now, this is the Madagascar palm right here, and um, it looks pretty much just like any other tree, and most of the people um, in Madagascar that were studying trees did not recognize this as a different species of tree. Well, in 2008, this tree itself here had um, a giant almost looking like another tree growing out of the top of it. So this thing right here is actually the fruiting body of this tree. Now, so it grew this thing out in just a year um, and these fruits came out and um, a bunch of seeds were produced and you know released and hopefully those seeds germinate into the more Madagascar palms. So people were surprised at this and were, um, you know, trying to figure out, well, th th this tree was literally in someone's backyard and um, they looked back at when was the last time that this, this thing happened and they found out it was somewhere about 100 years ago. And what it, we found out is that um, these trees really only flower, they only reproduce every 100 years, okay? so 
they um, scientists looked for the more of these trees out in in Madagascar and only found a hundred of them total. And if you know anything about the land use of Madagascar, it's um, they're having some trouble. There's lots of agriculture moving in and destroying the natural forest, and there's only a hundred trees of these left, hundred individuals left, right? So if we want to all of a sudden increase the population. Well, we can't do that, right? Because it, it's going to take a hundred years or naturally natural reproduction. We can't even like really help them out because they're not going to um, reproduce again for another hundred years. Uh, another example of this is potentially like like whales, right? Um, we stopped whaling, you know, on a, lot, a big scale uh, about a hundred and fifty years ago. Maybe not that long, but like. A hundred years ago, there's, um, you know, hasn't really been very much whaling. Whaling was pretty much all banned across the world in the 1970s. But whale populations have been extremely slow to rebound because um, it takes so long for them to reproduce. They only have one baby at a time. So whether it takes, you know, a long time for them to reproduce or have only have one baby at a time, it, it's hard for these populations, um, these organisms to bounce back if their population does get um, uh, affected by some natural or human um, factor. All right, that's it for this lecture.